this lecture is going to have lecture. Talk is going to have two parts. Um, the talk has two parts. One is I'm going to attempt to define neurophilosophy, <laughs> describe what it is, and then in the second part, I'm going to uh, give you an example of neurophilosophy research that I do for my PhD. Now, <coughs> um, it's a tricky field because it's pretty new, and uh, because it's so new, it's likely that the definition is, is going to be um, highly debated. But I'm going to try and give you a brief description of what it is. So we have neuroscience, which is the study of the flesh inside the skull, the little thing that we call the brain, one of the most complex things we've ever encountered in the universe. Um, so it involves the study of the cells, how the neurons work, how the neurons communicate with each other, how the circuitry communicates with each other. And the philosophy aspect of it, I divide into two parts. So philosophy is a field that you can find in the foundations of every field. So philosophy of music, philosophy of physics, philosophy of science. <coughs> in neurophilosophy, we have the combination of philosophy of mind and philosophy of science. So philosophy of mind is asking questions about the mind. What is the mind? What is the stuff of the mind made of? What is the relationship between the mind and the brain? What is consciousness? What are memories? What are false memories? Um, what is attention? What is perception? I'm getting, yeah, I'm sure you get the idea by now. Um, philosophy of science is asking questions about how science works. So what is the scientific method? How do you define the scientific method? What is evidence? What is a hypothesis? How do you test a hypothesis? How do you make advancements in science? Do you ever make advancements in science? And so on. So when you have a Venn diagram of these three, the intersection of them is um, what I would like to call neurophilosophy. So you would find in the intersection between the philosophy of mind and philosophy of science, you would find questions about what methods of study can we use to study the mind. Is introspection a viable method? Is um, the scientific method of psychology a viable method? Is neuroscience a good method? And in the intersection between philosophy of mind and neuroscience, we have questions about how neuroscientific data can help answer questions about the philosophy of mind uh, debates on perception, Cognition, attention, consciousness, I listed them all earlier. And uh, questions here are about how the structure of the scientific method is applied in neuroscience and um, how hypothesis testing happens there. I work primarily in the area right in the center where the three of them combine. And the question I ask for my thesis is how do we study the nature of concepts in um, our mind using neuroscientific data? And can we study them? So. Um, what is a concept? And so I'm going, to, I'm going to ask you a few really broad questions to zone in on what a concept is. How, the first really huge question is, how do you understand what I'm saying? I'm using words to communicate things to you, and you're all hopefully understanding what I'm saying, and you're all not along, so I assume you are. And uh, each of the words, how do you, I'm guessing that each of the words contribute to the meaning of the sentence as well. It's, and how do we understand the words, right? So what, is, what does it mean for you to understand the meaning of these words? And how are the meaning of these words represented in the brain? Now, these are mammoth questions that I am obnoxious enough um, to try and answer in <laughs> during my time. So what does philosophy say about concepts, right? Let's say you came across the written word Yoda. It is written there, you read it, and that's you. And by virtue of some mechanism in the brain, you are able to then understand that the written word Yoda refers to the thing in the world, or the thing Yoda, the person, right? Now, it is, in philosophy, we say that it is by virtue of owning the concept that you are capable of representing the thing in the world, that you're capable of having the thought about Yoda, you're capable of understanding what I'm saying when I say the words. So you can have concepts of Yoda, tectonic plates, clouds, um, the sentence that I'm saying right now is composed of the concepts, this sentence I'm saying right now. OK? Cool. Now, uh, we define concepts as the elements of thought in philosophy. So just to make it clear, there are three different things here. One is the representation of the thing in the world, and there is the concept in our mind. Yeah? And there's the thing in the world. So what are some of the philosophical questions that we have fun asking when we talk about concepts? Some of them include what's inside a concept. What if the concept is a representation of 
uh, this thing, for example, if I split that concept open, what do I expect to find inside it? And what is the structure of the concept? And uh, how does the concept work? Now, there are two main schools of thought, and as all things with philosophy, it's difficult to draw a line between these schools of thought, so it's a spectrum between empiricism and rationalism, and people almost never find themselves properly in this spectrum. They're always somewhere in between. So, uh, the first school of thought is empiricism. Empiricism states that uh, a concept, if not exhaustively, is wholly made by perceptual data. So, if I see the things around me, if I have a concept of Yoda, it's composed of the sensory information that I have about Yoda. Yeah? So, visuals about Yoda, sounds Yoda makes, what it's like to touch, smell or taste Yoda. <laughs> yeah? Now, if you think about this uh, school of thought a little more, you'll see that one possible counterexample to this are things like infinity, or negative numbers, or zero, or numbers. These are things I've never touched, I don't know about you guys, but I've never had the opportunity to feel or experience infinity perceptually. And so the argument against the empiricist would be, how do you, um, you know, capture the concept of infinity using sensory data? Yeah? Okay. So, so you have two schools of thought. One, empiricism that says that if these are the boundaries of the concept, on the inside you're expected to find um, perceptual data about the concept. But rationalism says, no, you, we should not have perceptual data when you draw the definition of a concept. Instead, a concept should be just a symbolic mental representation of the thing in the world. Just as a word is a symbol that has nothing to do with the thing it represents. Does it make sense? So just as Chinese people speak Chinese, the philosopher named Jerry Fodor said that we can call these words mentalese, or words within the mind, or the language of thought. Yeah? And this is separate from uh, sensory information about that which it represents. Now, just as, um, so just as a car has a certain function by virtue of certain constitution, certain constituents, so it has an engine. So if you remove the engine, it can't perform the function. So the question about the constitution of concepts leads into the function, or what concepts are used for. The empiricist would say that the concept is used to both represent and categorize things in the world. So the empiricist would say, it is by virtue of owning the concept that I can see and look at this picture and go like, oh, that's Yoda's picture. And look at this picture and go like, oh, that's not Yoda. <coughs> So the rationalist, on the other hand, would say, no, you don't use co concepts to categorize things in the world, you only use them to represent things. So if I were to have the thought that Yoda lives in India, it would be composed of the concepts Yoda lives in India, and it's just to have these thoughts, it's not to categorize things that I see. Okay? I don't know why I keep asking, okay, it's not like you guys are going to respond anyway. So, uh, <laughs> what, so. Now the question is, what can we learn about concepts from the neuroscience, right? So, if you, so the experiment was done where you, we scanned people's brains and then we scanned them while they were looking at pictures of faces, houses, chairs, shoes, cats, dogs, hands, all kinds of different things, and we got um, a distributed pattern of activity across the cortex. And the same areas of the cortex also light up for when you see these things and classify these things. Uh, 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 when you use the concept and when you have perceptual experiences. So this seems to be um, data that might help an empiricist to say, hey, if I were to use the concept of a face or a house, the parts of my brain that are active when I'm having a perception are also active. So this is probably the case that there is sensory data in within a concept. Yeah? So if we look inside the most active areas within the distributed activity, we look inside the posterior ventral temporal lobe, and that's a candidate for where concepts might be stored, object concepts. So they, uh, neuroscientists believe that it uh, stores representation of uh, object concepts, and uh, if you damage this area, you have uh, diseases where you can't recognize objects. Uh, we'll go into that one next. And um, so experiments were done where you can show a person the picture of a bicycle, say the word bicycle, or read the word bicycle, all of which will is elicit the same pattern of activity within this part of the brain. Okay? So this would mean that um, scientists want to say this is where the abstract sort of um, meaning is represented in the brain, devoid of sensory um, commitments. So nonsense words and pictures do not elicit a strong response at all. And semantically related words 
but visually different stimuli. What does that mean? So if I have a bicycle and a motorbike, there are an overlap of neurons that activate for both. So this seems to be a candidate for where um, concepts are stored in the brain. And like I was saying earlier, if you damage this area, you have different sorts of diseases that come up. One of them is called prosbognosia. It's also called face blindness, where um, patients with face blindness cannot recognize faces. They can't recognize themselves in mirrors, and some of them can't read emotions. So you could be really angry with one of them, and from their facial expression, they won't be able to tell. They generally use cues like scarves, or the way you um, wear your hair, or the perfume that you wear, or shoes or necklaces to identify people. Now, uh, it might seem that we have data to support empiricism. However, babies discern faces from when they are very, very young. So from about a week old, they are capable of picking out a face within the things that they look, look at. And um, they look at faces more than they look at other objects. They have the ability to recognize familiar faces. They will look at your mom's face. No, <laughs> they will look at their mom's face. <laughs> more, <laughs> more than their dad's face. No, more than a stranger's face. And uh, they would probably look at able to discern between expressions as well. So they would be happier to cross. OK, this is a really cool experiment. I want to go into it quickly. A baby was put on a raised platform with a glass bridge across the platform. And there was a projection of different faces. The baby was uncomfortable to cross this glass bridge if it was an upside down face or if it was an angry face, but if it was a smiling face of his mom or her mom, it would attempt to try and cross the bridge. So it has an ability to discern between faces. And sometimes babies also look at the mom's face when a stranger enters to assess whether the stranger is a familiar, uh, you know, source of danger or is a, it's okay to, you know, stay calm. Um, so the question now is, if empiricists say that the function of a concept is to help categorize things in the world, is it by virtue of owning the face concept that the baby is capable of then looking at the face and saying, ah, that's a face? But if that's the case, then when did they have the time to acquire that? Because if a baby is super young and sees faces and is able to already discern faces and expressions and, and categorize them as people who they know and don't know, then when do they acquire the perceptual data that is required for defining the face concept, yeah? So this is an argument uh, against empiricism that favors rationalism. Just to quickly recap, if you were to see Yoda's face, what would the data, what would the activity in the inferior temporal lobe then say? The rationalist would say this is where the amodal um, cognitive symbol of the face is stored. And the empiricist would say, oh, that's where all the perceptual data about this concept is stored. <clears throat> so in conclusion, as we advance in technology, advance in processing power, advance in ability to store more data, neuroscience also advances with imaging data. And as neuroscience attempts to tackle bigger questions, they start um, knocking on the doors of philosophy. So when you ask questions like how we understand, how do you understand how we understand, then you have to ask philosophers um, to conduct the philosophical method, which is called conceptual analysis, which is to take a concept and then break it down into its constituents and find out how it's defined so that they can use the neuroscience data or they can conduct experiments to operationalize the definition. The word operationalize means if I take a word and then attempt to study it or test it in a neuroscientific, ex neuroscientific experiment, right? So, um, from the neuroscience data, we have the structure and function of the brain. And um, with philosophical analysis, we have questions like, what is a concept? How do you define a concept to then test for it? How do you define the functions of a concept to test for it? What is perception? Where do the borders of these two interactions lie? And the, the combination of um, neuroscientific data working alongside uh, the philosophical method is called neurophilosophy. So thank you. Sajid, yeah. thank you for your talk. So now we have five minutes for the questions. So if someone would like to ask a question, I'm also going to repeat questions for everyone to hear it. So someone? Please. Actually, I have one question. Uh, so uh, in one of the conferences, they were uh, talking about uh, transferring data between brains. Yeah. And I was wondering, what is your take on that? Like, uh, would it be possible to transfer data between trains, brains? So the question is, is it possible to transfer data between brains and what's your opinion about it from 
philosophical point of view, probably. Uh, my philosophical answer is, <laughs> is, is going to be along the lines of what exactly do you mean by data and what conditions should be satisfied for you to say, okay, data has been transferred between two brains. Because uh, the, um, there was a similar experiment with an at, at, at uh, MIT where they transferred um, the, the memory of, I, so this is such a difficult topic to go about when you're a philosopher, but the memory of a fear from, to, to, from one mouse to another, right? So, so the mouse is afraid of a certain color floor and it transferred that memory onto another mouse which is not afraid, but then became afraid. You can induce a false memory into it or a, create a false memory. Uh, you could, I mean, I guess you could technically transfer data, but then the question still remains, what is the format of that data? Is it cognitive symbols, like Fodor and rationalists would say, or is it uh, perceptual data, uh, like the empiricist would say? So, yeah. yeah philosophers. I like guess I did not answer your question, I made it more confusing. <laughs> just, they, just, they just like to ask a lot of questions, right? Philosophers like but to But now ask you know how difficult that problem will, is to solve. So. <laughs> That's my job. <laughs> Please. Just carry on. Yeah, yeah. The theoretically, if transferring the data between two brains, actually you are transferring data to our brain. Yeah. So <coughs> it should be like uh, the method. It should not be usual. Otherwise, I can tell you oh, there is a bomb and. Is it is it a question? I just <laughs> I'm really sorry, but <laughs> uh, there is like. The method, which is not like, we don't know, not by telling or okay. other than five methods. Yeah, so I'm, I'm guessing he meant along the lines of like a USB card where I plug it in somewhere and I, oh, I now I know Kung Fu. About the uh, <laughs> mouses, yeah. you said. Yeah. How did they manage? Like, it is not their language or their so the special expressions or something. If, if I got it correctly, what was the method of transferring this? In Memory between two mouse. Jesus, nice. probably shouldn't have brought that up. Uh, so <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yes, stop right here. So <laughs> it was um, uh, modifying synaptic connections, and that's as far as I would um, dare to go. But um, it wasn't using the. Okay, so someone said yes over there. Yes, the neuroscientist has answered. So it would be yeah. modifying synaptic connections to then induce a sort of fear memory of. Um, yeah. So we have time for one short question, please. Short it is not, it's a bit long, so... <laughs> Go ahead, it's okay. Fight Try system. to make it short. <laughs> that neurophilosophy is a mix of neuroscience, which is more materialized, right? Which is more about our brains and how they function mm -hmm. and how they are the cells of it and uh, the, org like the organ, the brain. Mm -hmm. and the on the other hand, you have the philosophy which is more cognitive, right? So, I, I'm not sure what's a question mark. I was going because I was thinking, so... Yeah. Yeah. I, I need to repeat, I need to repeat the question because people will not hear it on the stream, sorry. Not the full question, okay, okay. <laughs> Come on, go on, go on. So, if you're saying if the neuroscience is more materialized, let's yeah. say, and philosophy is more cognitive, mm -hmm. do you see any tendency that the people who are studying neuroscience would believe in the school that says Yoda should be touchable, should be materialized? And the people who study philosophy, they have the tendency to understand Yoda as something mental, like a meta language, as you said. So, as far as I understood, the question was, other people who study neuroscience have more tendency to follow their rational school of thought, to the contrary to philosophers who are more empirical, or in our way around? So, so the thing is, every neuroscience experiment that is conducted already has a presupposition of a certain philosophy uh, in order to then c accumulate data to support a hypothesis. So why, like uh, this goes back to the philosophy of science question, why does certain data um, support certain hypotheses? Now if you had the hypotheses that concepts have percepts inside them, right, and then the question is how do you test for those things, then you would fabricate an experiment wherein you've presupposed what functions a concept has. Yeah, so. Um, all experiments in, philosophy, uh, in uh, neuroscience will have, all experiments in neuroscience that attempt to study the mind will have a certain philosophy of mind that they presuppose. And part of the job that I have as a neurophilosopher is to then to assess whether or not the conversation between philosophers and, and uh, neuroscientists are actually about the same thing. So when neuroscientists say concepts, when they talk about these experiments, and philosophers say concepts, are they the same thing?
So coming back to, yeah. my, to my job, I should say that we are out of time. Yeah. So thank you, Sachit. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.